Looks like we've got some standers in the back too. Sorry, there's no, uh, <laughs> there's not enough seating. Um, let's see. Um, do your best to, you know, when we get into the the hands-on stuff, do your best to huddle around. Uh, you know, some people that already have tenant IDs. We have 50 tenant IDs um, that we've given out. Uh, there's, I think there's two per table on both sides of the room. Um, so we'll get into what that's all about here in uh, just later on in, in the session. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm Cameron Cedar. I worked for Sousa. I worked for Sousa for over nine years. And uh, uh, I've been doing a lot of OpenStack ever since uh, its inception and uh, messing around with Sousa Cloud specifically. And, uh, and then we have Jason from Rackspace. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for coming out. What a uh, great uh, showing. I'm, I'm very excited to see all the interest in heat. Um, I'm an open cloud architect on the uh, Rackspace private cloud team. And um, even though I'm on the private cloud team, there's a lot of uh, heat integration and public cloud integration. Um, and there's a move to the enterprise, and on the enterprise side, they're really looking at heat to replace some of the orchestration uh, tools that they have. So I'm happy to be here, and I'll be helping out um, with the hands-on piece. And then if we get time at the end, we'll look at um, some other areas like uh, load balance, load balancer as a service, and L3 and some things like that. Thank you. Awesome. So this is what we're looking at today. This is the order of operation. We're going to do a little bit of an introduction here to heat, and then we're going to do a hands-on exercise, okay? You're going to grab a heat stack uh, that I've provided uh, for you to learn and grow from this experience. You're going to load that heat stack into the tenant ID that, that's been given out, okay? And then we're going to launch that heat stack. Um, we have what we're calling right here our lap stack. <laughs> it's a bunch of laptops, okay, all wired up. Um, it's got OpenStack, uh, SUSE Cloud distribution um, with the router. We have a Wi-Fi access point. It doesn't have internet access, but just strictly access to this OpenStack environment. So you'll be connecting up to this um, during the session. And then uh, we'll do some more advanced stuff, uh, which Jason will kind of run you through um, using some stuff there on Rackspace's uh, infrastructure. Okay. <clears throat> so service deployment, that's really what heat is, is all about. Um, making it easy. Um, is it really easy? There's, there's several different ways to, to really skin this, this heat stack thing. Um, there's the easy way, there's the not quite so easy way, and then there's the hard up front, but totally easier in the end way. <laughs> so there's several ways. To, in fact, there's, there's actually several uh, types of templates that you can use in heat as well. So, when you dig into heat for the first time, there is lots and lots of learning that goes on here. So how do I deploy it the easy way? <clears throat> you log into the dashboard, you go to your images, and then you select your image, you launch it, configure your networking, you now have an image launched in your OpenStack environment. Pretty simple. <clears throat> The not quite so easy way, using the API, making it service driven, takes a lot longer to do. Um, so you're going to do some programming, it's gonna take a little bit of time to get that uh, all nailed out with some Q&A with your, uh, whatever application you're gonna you know, control that with. Um, so not terribly friendly to everybody. So that's the not quite so easy way. And then there's the hard up front, but totally easier in the end. So from Project Grizzly, 
Um, heat has been in there. Now, Grizzly was, I mean, there's a lot of problems in that particular code. But uh, Havana uh, works really well. Um, it's fully supported in SUSE Cloud 3. Um, so this is what's going to provide your orchestration layer in OpenStack today. <coughs> so Heat um, uses an OpenStack native REST API, um, and it also uses the cloud formation uh, compatible query API. Okay, so that's important to know because you can actually, a lot of times I find it a lot easier to actually go out to the Amazon documentation and pull out the stuff from there to create my heat stack. Uh, it, it's, it's so much easier because the OpenStack uh, manual pages <laughs> don't do it sometimes. Um, they don't always have everything that I need. Um, so I always you know, go back and forth. So Heat allows you to pre-divine a set of parameters like your compute infrastructure, your networking infrastructure, your storage. Um, so you can do software-defined networking, have it create its own uh, you know, private network, a private LAN that you have databases uh, spinning up on, and you have applications accessing that database over that, uh, over that LAN. Um, and it does it all by magic, right? That's what we all hope. <clears throat> so let's dig right into it. All the hands-on. So this is, hopefully you don't have a lot of challenges. I've tried to make it uh, as such where, uh, where we can really uh, dig in and learn what these, what's in these templates, okay? Um, so that you can get a real good understanding, get, get started on creating heat templates. Um, so we have 50 tenant IDs, um, and the usernames are user 1 through 50, and their passwords are also the user 1 through 50. So you should be able to hit this URL right now if, you're, if you are hitting this Wi-Fi. Um, the SSID is SUSE and the passphrase Suza Geeko. And so you should be able to hit the 192.168.124.141 address. Everybody hitting that? It's asking for a numeric pin. Yeah. It's asking for a numeric pin. Alejandro? Oh, okay, sorry. You got it? Yeah, there's a... Okay. Yeah, raise your hand if, you, if you're having some trouble. We'll walk around. We got some folks to help, so... Okay? <laughs> These other URLs here... Um, the 192.168.124.10 slash share, that address um, you're going to need here uh, later on. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'll go back to this page, okay? Yeah, it's uh, Sousa Gecko. Okay. Now, when we log into our tenant ID, the first thing that we're going to do um, is create some security groups, okay? Has everybody created a security group before? <laughs> I certainly hope so. Oh. I'll give you just a couple more minutes while you guys are getting this stuff down. Raise your hand if you need some help.
So they're really, you know, on your tables, there really should only be one or two of you connecting per group because we're limited on IP addresses as well. So some of us are running into some not being able to get an IP address, <laughs> okay? So let's, let's be careful with that on divvying up those IP addresses, all right? So once you're logged in, just hold right there and then we'll get the we templates, okay? All right. Let's make sure that we can get at least, at least four laptops per table logged into this web interface. That should give us enough room to kind of huddle around a little bit uh, per table, okay? Can I get a raise of hand who, who is not set up? Okay. So we got just a minimal few. Okay. We can't have everybody on it, so um, some of you aren't going to be able to connect, so you'll need to huddle around somebody that is close by you. Okay? Um, we did our best to accommodate. <laughs> I'm sorry if you can't connect. Um,
Yeah, I'll show you some stuff on the screen. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Now the first thing we're going to do inside the web interface, inside Horizon, you've logged in with your tenant ID already. Once we've logged in, we're going to create some security groups. These security groups are required for the heat stack we're deploying. So when you deploy a heat stack, you have to make sure if you're, if you're using security groups in your heat stack, you have to make sure that those are deployed already. Okay, make sure that those are, those are set up in the environment, in that tenant environment already. Okay, and I'll show you why here in just a minute. So once you create the www security group, in fact, you might find that the, the security groups are already there. I think the security groups are already pre-populated. If they are, what you'll need to do is go in and create a rule. And so you'll need to create the HTTP rule for www and the MySQL rule for MySQL security group. That should be fairly easy. Raise your hand if you need some help doing that. We're going to rock around. So let's go ahead and create those uh, security groups, create the rules for the security groups, okay? So in the www security group, let's create a rule called HTTP. And it's just a drop down list, you'll see HTTP in there. Okay, it's already pre-populated for Horizon, okay? And this, the same goes for MySQL. Go into the MySQL security group, add a new rule. In the drop down list, you'll see MySQL. It's pre populated for Horizon. And go ahead and add that as well. I've also added in the command. If you want to do it from the command line, we're not going to do that today, however. If you were doing this in your own lab, you could in fact use the Nova security group list and list out the security groups that you have in there. There's also the Nova security group create. Um, there's also the um, Neutron also has security group, group creation as well. Um, what this process is doing is creating those, the IDs that are actually required for us to create the heat stack. Sorry, what was that? Yep. Yeah, just a port 80. We don't need HTTPS. We're not doing the execute, okay? That's just information. If you can take back to your, your own lab and run it from the command line if you'd like, okay? We're not gonna do that part. So I, I should probably remove that from the slides. We will 
take that out. Don't want to confuse anybody. We're not. So what this process is doing is it's adding in some IDs for us that, that we're going to pull out here in the, in the next step. Okay? And I'll show you what these IDs are and, what, and where they're used. Okay? Again, that's just some information. You're not going to add in any IDs, okay? You're going to be grabbing the, when you create the www and the MySQL security groups, it creates a long UUID in OpenStack. Those are the IDs that we're going to be grabbing. No. So if you've already edited your rules, show of hands who hasn't created their rules. Okay, we got one guy in the back, two in the back. Okay, next step, we're going to create a key pair, okay? So go to your access and security again, and let's go ahead and create a key pair. Um, you can call it, you know, tenant one or whatever tenant you are. That would work fine um, to make it simple. Um, or you can give it a special name. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me, just remember what that is, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to input that key pair into our heat template. But we're not going to do that step yet. All I want you to do is create that key pair. Just go into Horizon and create your key pair. Need help with the key pair? Yeah, hit access and security again. No, oh, didn't we go down too far? Key pair. Yeah, okay. yeah, we went too far. yeah, it's a little tricky. If you can't see key pairs there, you might need to click on the, the left bar again under access and security, and then it'll show up as a tab option for you. Who needs help with the key pair? Awesome. All right. We're moving on. Now, this is not a step that we're going to do. I'm going to explain a couple of things before we move on. We have the Nova network. And what you can see here, this is some JSON code that uh, is pulled out from the heat stack template that we're going to be using. And I just want to explain it just a little bit. Um, you see the default ID in there. You'll see a long UUID. That is a UUID that, need, that we need to pull out specific for our environment. Now that UUID, the, um, the floating network, is the same across the entire OpenStack infrastructure. So I have that in a file that I showed you earlier, and you can all grab that. Um, we're not going to grab it yet. I'll tell you when to grab it. <laughs> um, I have some information in here. You can use the Nova Netlist if you're going to use the CLI in your own lab to do this. 
Um, so you can play around with that. We'll actually list out all the Nova networks. And so you can grab that UUID that you'll need for your heat stack template. Okay. The next thing is the fixed network also. It also has the UUID that we'll need to pull out because we are using that in our heat template as well. So again, that's just another UUID that we're going to need to pull out for our heat stack. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to go back to here. Now here's where the editing fund comes in. So whoever you have designated as your editor <laughs> on the table, if you haven't designated an editor yet, let's go ahead and do so. And we're going to open up or download uh, the one that says heat template wordpress.json. So let's go ahead and get that downloaded, open that up in your favorite editor, and we're going to walk through editing that. And I'm going to pull it up on my screen, okay? Is everybody able to get that downloaded? Who's not? Sweet. Okay. Yes, some, some people need to go back. Oops, sorry. My, my Shift F5 skills are not working today. You could go to just the slash share and you'll see the files in there as well. So, and then you can just save them from there. Okay. All right. So I'm going to open up this template just in the web browser. I don't like that view. Let's, uh, let's enlarge it quite a bit. Can everybody see that in the back? Okay. So we have the floating network. We have the fixed network. Let's focus on those two first. Okay. We need to grab our floating network and our fixed network UUIDs. And so what I've done, I've actually uh, exported those out uh, under network-list.text. So you'll find those in there. So I've already exported them for you. You'll just need to copy them into your JSON file, okay, in that, uh, in that location. So that's, that's the task right now, copying those UUIDs over into the right location. Make sure you're putting the floating network as it's labeled in the JSON file in the right location and the fixed network in the right location, okay? Oh, it is correct. Some are saying it's, it's correct already. So maybe I did some work for you. <laughs> Does it? Okay. That's probably correct then. So if it's matching already, no editing then. Okay. 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 Does everybody remember when we created our key pair? Do you remember the name that you used when you created your key pair? 
If you did, then you'll need to enter that in right here, where you see key name and the, the default string. The one that's in there is C Cedar. That's my user ID. Um, so you'll need to change that for your key pair. Just put in the name that you used, okay? So edit the file, drop in that key pair name. This part right here. Question. Can you not just go in and import from the URL? It already has everything listed. You can. However, if you import what's there from the URL, it's not going to match everything in your in your tenant ID. There are some things that are different, so it won't launch correctly. Okay, so you will have to modify the, some things. But you could, in fact, and that's a great idea. You could, in fact, do that in your own labs. You know, have have them hosted on a UR on a on a web server somewhere, and you could actually import them using that that web server. Okay. Good point. Is everybody able to get that edited for the key pair? Okay. We'll go ahead and move on. We've got instance, instant, instance type. <laughs> um, I've already populated this one with a special flavor called Sousa. Um, so we don't, won't need to touch that. In your labs, you might need to. Um, you might need to mess with that if you want to have something larger. Uh, you could change that default value to M1 medium or large if you like. Um, okay. The volume, the WordPress volume size, we don't need to. We don't need to mess with. The MySQL volume size, we don't need to mess with. The WordPress version and the MySQL version. Those are being pulled out from the, the images that I've already pre-populated. So you'll see two images already in there. Okay, so it's important that that image name has a version ID on there. That's where it's grabbing that, uh, that version from, that string. Okay. Now we get to some fun stuff. These are going to be different for every single one of your tenants. So this is very important that we actually copy these correctly. I have a file that is populated with everybody's UUID. Um, I'm actually going to run a for loop right now and get that uh, created again. Uh, my colleague informs me that it's not up to snuff right now, so I will get that fixed really fast. This will just take, make, take me a moment here. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> it helps to uh, source the right file.
Okay, it should be correct now. Your sequence is only to 30 again. Your sequence is only to 30 again. You, you only went 1 to 30 again. Thank you for that. <laughs> Someone else said it, actually. Team programming is best. <laughs> no one likes to type in front of a room full of people. We'll recreate. <laughs> Yeah, at first we thought, oh, 30 will be fine. <laughs> it's a good thing we did 50. All right, so it's all there. So let's skip on back over to, to here. So we're back to editing our template file. So open up that text file that I just copied over to that share directory. So you can go out to that web URL, go to share, and you'll see that security group text file. Find your tenant ID, and you will see all the, the UUIDs that you need to copy out for each one of those uh, groups that you see in your, in your template file, okay? users. Okay, let me take a look at it. Some tenants don't have. We found it. We just scroll all the way down. For somebody that has a student. Oh, gosh. All right. Let me. <laughs> I, I see what the problem is. Uh, let me fix that real quick. That's what happens when you loop over that same file a couple of times dirties it up. Okay, try again. That looks better. Back to the heat template. We go down where we have www.sec group and the MySQL sec group and default set group. Pull out the UUID from that text file that I just updated for your specific tenant ID and drop them into your template file here. Okay? Who needs help? Everybody got this task done? You guys are good. Raise of hands, you're ready to move on? Okay, we got a few. Okay, we'll wait just a few more minutes, like let everybody get caught up. <coughs> We're almost ready to launch our heat template, we're getting close.
Then, then we can really see how our lap stack really holds up. <laughs> uh, yeah, each, each one of these laptops has 32 gigabytes of RAM. And we've got plenty of disk space to accommodate all these you know, instances. So we'll see how well it does. We did some pre-caching on a lot of these images, so it should it should should work out. The UUIDs for the security groups, they should be different for every tenant. Yeah, so if you copied the UIDs before I actually reran my script to repopulate it, then you have the wrong ID. Because we actually, <laughs> in our testing, we, we actually blew everything, blew everything away and recreated it. And I didn't run that script. So you'll need to go in and, and copy the ones that are there now, because those ones are correct, OK? <laughs> Just so you're clear. All right. OK, so the reason why we're doing this is because when you're creating a, a heat template and you're using security groups, you need to be aware that when you have security groups in your heat templates, they're different for every tenant ID. Okay, And so you're going to have to go in and add in those IDs into your heat templates. Okay, Manual process. Let me come over here so I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, this is JSON format. This is basic uh, UTF-8 JSON format, OK? No, no. So you brought up a good point. Is a heat template always in JSON? No. There are other formats. In fact, there is a specific heat format that you can use. There's a JSON format, and there's an Amazon AWS format. Good grief. <laughs> you can get lost really fast, OK? Um, so do some homework on that. There's lots, there's lots of reading you can do on the various formats. I find that the AWS one is a lot easier because there's a lot more documentation out there. Um, you know, quite frankly, going through some of the JSON stuff and some of the stuff on OpenStack.org is uh, some of it's a little bit limiting. Um, some of it works. There are some some pre-canned templates that you can grab from OpenStack.org as well to play around with. So um, do some testing in your own labs with that stuff. But there are the, there are different formats. Good point. Yes. Say again. So he's asking, what's my recommendation? My recommendation is Amazon AWS format because if you have a public cloud and you've already got some templates written, you can utilize them in both places. Just kind of makes sense. Yeah, it just makes sense that way that you would have that backwards compatibility between your public and your private. That's correct. So she asked, is it Amazon only supports their format? Yes. So everybody ready to move on from the UUIDs? Who still needs help on those? You need help on the floating IP? So those, are, those should be already ready to go. OK, so don't even, yeah, I already, already set those up for you. 
<laughs> Let's move on. We have some mappings going on here. Uh, these are actually for, um, for the instances that get launched. And then we have some resource set up. We're setting up uh, some networks. We've got a data network that we're setting up. And then there's the subnet that's tied with it. So it's a 172.16. So when we launch this, this heat stack, you'll see that come into play here. And then we've got uh, some ports that are going to be opened up there. Notice how, notice how it still says quantum in there. <laughs> that's some, yeah, still some uh, programming to do to get those all changed. Um, so be aware of that. Um, and there's different ports for each one of the, for WordPress, we've got multiple ports for the networking. So the WordPress uh, image will have two networking interfaces. He's tied to the data network and the fixed network. And I believe the MySQL is only tied to the data network. So the MySQL database is completely isolated inside your cloud, which is really sweet. You can't even access it from outside at all. You can't even get to it. The only, the only thing that can get to it is your WordPress image. Pretty darn secure. That's pretty hardened. All that data is really secure behind all that, uh, that security there in, in your cloud. Um, we don't need to mess around with any of the floating IP stuff here. Um, and then here's the basic instance uh, setup. Um, pay attention to the term availability zone. If you have a, cloud, a private cloud environment where you've actually created availability zones, you would need to modify that for your specific environment if you have an availability zone. You could, in fact, have uh, your web server on one availability zone and your database on another availability zone. And those get tied together. So you could do it that way if that's how you have your, your private cloud set up. Uh, and then we've got a volume, a couple of volumes, actually, that we're actually creating for uh, each instance both WordPress and MySQL. And then it's creating a mount point reference for those. And that's it. That's our heat stack. So we've done all the heavy lifting, the editing. <laughs> Not really heavy lifting, but. <coughs> now we can switch over to the Horizon dashboard. <coughs> Yes, question. So, obviously, the WordPress front end server is known on the data. Is that Yes. Yes. It is not. These images are set up in a way that they automatically set that up inside the image. Now, there are, that's a good point to bring up because there are ways within a heat stack, some more advanced methodology, to actually traverse into the image and actually make some changes there and you know have it connect up to that the database back end and make some changes within the database that kind of thing we're not doing that here these particular images were created using SUSE studio so we've actually already pre-populated some items within the image itself so we don't need to do all that heavy lifting with with the heat stack so there's a couple of different methods that you can take there. Yes? How does the WordPress instance find out the IP address of the MySQL backend? Um, in this particular case, <coughs> it's, setting, it's being set up with a, the Nova Fix network. And so, um, it will also, on the back end, the database will also get set up with the fixed network as well. So both of them will have that. You can do it that way. I think, in, actually, in this case, we are actually populating it on the, the database is being populated with an IP address on the data network that we're, we've actually created a new network called data. And so 
we've already populated the WordPress image with an IP address on that network so it can connect to it automatically once it's launched. Okay? But you could do that within the heat stack itself. Um, but these are pre-populated pre images that have that already done. Yes? So is it a mixture of OpenStack and AWS? This particular one is just strictly AWS. <laughs> Say that again. Yes, yes, those, yes. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> You make up, that's, that's a good point. Um, so he has, so he's asking if, if they are mixed between the AWS and the OpenStack templates. There are uh, resources that you can define uh, within that come out of OpenStack um, that also fit in with a, the AWS templates as well. So, um, but the formatting is, is the same as what you would see in AWS. Yes. Yes. These instances have already been created. Um, they're already pre-populated images. We're using heat to orchestrate the deployment of those. He's asking, would we use these fixed IP addresses in production? The answer is yes, you would use these fixed IPs in production. You, you're going to have a different address space, of course, um, than what I'm using here, but yeah. Yes. That's if the IP address is a fixed IP address. In this case, it's not. It, it is dynamic. So, ah, but it does DHCP. Okay. I'm sorry. It's not populated, the image itself is not populated with a static IP address, but it's populated that to know that it's, it can connect on that network, that data network. So the data network that we're creating is a DHCP, ne DHCP network. So once it's launched, it will get a DHCP address from the data network as well as the database. And so then they can communicate on that network. Yes. That's correct. I can show you more details about the image afterwards if you'd like. Yeah. Um, I, so I, yes. I think we have kind of the same question, but we get okay. They're on the same network. They can communicate the the application and the database. But how does the application know where the database is? But what IP address? I think it will all come together when we launch it. Okay. So let's do that. We're ready to launch it. So let's go to the Horizon dashboard, okay, on that 141 uh, IP address. So you should be right back here, 192.168.124.141, okay. And if you're logged in under your project, I'm going to actually use the OpenStack project. At the very bottom on the left side, you're going to see orchestration, and under that is stacks. So we'll need to select stacks, and there's a button in the upper right hand corner. You can select launch stack. In our case, we're going to point to the file that we've been editing, and hopefully it's on your local machine somewhere. So select file and browse to it. Yeah. 
This is going to be fun. We're all going to hit the box at once. <laughs> And uh, once you have that template file already populated in there, hit next. And now we can give it a stack name, call it whatever you want. The password for the user admin is crowbar, all, all underscore, crowbar, all lowercase, sorry, all, all lowercase. It was, it was a late, late, late night last night. <laughs> Sorry? No, no, no. Admin? Right here. Everybody should have admin. No? If it says user, then use user one as, or user and the number for your, your tenant then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So put in your password for that tenant user. And then scroll all the way to the bottom. You can see it's populated everything with your UUIDs and everything that we have in that template. And then you can go ahead and hit launch. And when you're ready, go ahead and hit launch. And it's going to start creating your heat stack. If your heat stack fails, you've got a problem with your UUIDs or something there. Uh, who, who's having errors? Okay. Okay. I'm going to come by and look, but do one bit of troubleshooting. So I, I should have mentioned this earlier. If, all, if you know all of your... If you know all of your U, UUIDs are, are good, everything looks good, um, check your, so JSON is very sensitive to white space. So if you do a tab instead of a space, or if you mess up the white space at all, um, it doesn't work. So what, is, like, what errors are you getting? Okay, that's, so I would say that the flavor ID can't be found. <laughs> yeah, that's that's no. my problem. That's my mistake. Let me think about it. No, I'm kidding. Let me um, fix that. I'm not kidding, though, but uh, it's good that it's gotten better at debugging. The, the, console sometimes, the console sometimes will say your heat stack failed um, and not give a lot of traps back. Uh, but something like that, I mean, go and double check your flavor IDs. Who's getting an error like that's vague, uh, more vague than that? So. You basically kill the stack. Uh, I guess I don't need to be yelling at anybody. If you got an error on the Sousa flavor, delete it and then launch it again. Delete your, your stack that you've created and then launch it again.
How's everybody doing? So if you're getting that error about the Sousa flavor, delete your stack and start it up again, OK? Because I just fixed it. Try the Sousa flavor. Hitting the top of the hour, um, and uh, who's got their heat stack launched? Who has it working? Raise the hands. We got one here, maybe. Okay. Okay. And everything's when you click on it, is is everything green? Does it look like uh, Does it look like that? Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. They, they weren't prepared for this. <laughs> Mine's still creating. Yeah, at this point, we're, we're hitting the disks on this lap stack pretty darn hard after we've started deleting. Uh, after we've deleted our stacks, it's actually deleting it over here, too. So those partial creations are being deleted. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of time. Mine's still actually deploying. Uh, it takes a few minutes. Yes. Yeah, it's very possible we might be running out of disk space, too. <laughs> um, 
So if we go over to instances, actually we're going to go to admin. They can show you kind of a global view. We've got WordPress from tenant number 24. It's spawning. Um, we've got tenant one, tenant two, um, tenant 11. Yeah, we've got some of you guys running. Uh, some of them are. Um, uh, yes. Uh, you won't be able to get to that floating IP on this particular network you're connected to, though. Not the, not the public IP address, no. We don't have that routed through our, our stuff here. Not this one, no. No. No, we don't have that routed out. Yeah, where's that one at? <laughs> 10 and 2, you're launching with an M1 medium, a 40 gigabyte disk. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's, there's, there's part of our problem on, on some of our... Uh, our load on our systems here. <laughs> this is not an ideal production environment. You, you, don't, you don't deploy a lap stack. <laughs> but I hope you learn from this on how to deploy a heat stack, OK? It's a good exercise. I hope you learn from it. Um, Jason Grimm's got a couple of things he wanted to talk about. so. Jason, you want to jump into that right now? Um, what I'm hoping is you can take you can take that template back to your labs and you can play around with it some more, and uh, you know see if you can add some more things to that heat template. Uh, maybe change it a little bit and uh, deploy a different kind of database or something possibly.
So um, while we're waiting for the video to switch out, we only have 15 minutes left, and I'm going to go through you know a, a couple of things that you can also look at. But kind of while we're waiting, are there any questions? And uh, if there are, uh, okay, g go ahead and go to the mic if you would, because they're doing a recording. What's the best way to debug some of these failures that we're seeing? I mean, what do you look at other than the fact that it says the create fail? Um, very good question and very acute observation that the uh, debugging uh, leaves some to be uh, desired in, in Horizon. So at the CLI and the API level, you get a much richer um, return on the, on the errors. So th the first suggestion is to you know, get into a, a level of comfort where you can start doing more of the CLI. So Horizon is the probably smallest and most fledgling and most underserved um, project in the OpenStack ecosystem. So everything, all the functionality comes out at the API level and you have 100% functionality and when they go GA uh, and, and bless a um, version, it becomes trunk, and, you know, it's certified for, for lack of a better term. API works 100%. CLI, you're going to get about 80%. Um, Horizon's going to lag behind at about 60% functionality. So um, it's just a, if it was a product that was being sold, it would be a de-emphasized feature, right? Um, because most of, the, most of the power and most of the use case and most of the scale and all of that stuff is being done at the API and CLI level. So it's not a great answer, but it, it, we're on a six month release cycle. so. And people are, it, I get that question every time I talk to someone uh, about EAT, so, um, you know, we'll get more mature. Um, but I would encourage you to move to the CLI or the API. Is there a log file in the Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, I, again, back to, the, you, can, you can take syslog and you can take any, any logging um, aggregation, any log uh, search, any, any log consolidation, any of that stuff. So, I mean, Splunk and it, everything else is gonna work. It's syslog, um, it all works. It, if it works on Linux, it works on OpenStack. So, there's a common you know, directory structure that those logs are in under bar and you can just scrape those. Um, so the question was, is there a common uh, debugging uh, app that's recommended for OpenStack? That's hard, to, that's hard to say. So one of the blessings and one of the curses uh, with OpenStack is that it is open and you can do anything you want with it. Um, I go, uh, I meet with customers every day who have very similar business models. It could be from one university to the other, one media company to the next. Um, and they, they use OpenStack in vastly different ways and they manage it and operate it in vastly different ways. So one of the things I was looking at, I had a monitoring talk and what I found was early on a frustration ad was why, why is there not more oper why isn't it more operationalized? Um, you've got this stuff in there to do it. You know, why aren't you giving me more logging? Why aren't you giving me more uh, richer interfaces and, and more um, alerting and things like that? So they didn't bake that in uh, by design. They are uh, maniacally kind of focused on infrastructure as a service and the core services because they don't want to reinvent or rebundle or recreate a tool set. They, they don't want to a, rewrite Nagios or, or, or put that into the product when Nagios has already been around since you know, 99 and it works on Linux. So there's an assumption that shops that OpenStack is deployed in already have a monitoring tool set and already have a logging tool set and already have a management model. And so Open OpenSec intentionally does not reinvent that. So the I mean, the upside of that, it's very fast. And there's not a lot of bloat. The downside is you've got to take your tool set and integrate it. Um, yes, uh, I'll show you where mine are posted and um, these guys, I'm, I'm sure, will do the same.
So this was, uh, this was two talks. This was the uh, hands-on uh, 101 workshop, and the uh, second talk was um, kind of an advanced topics uh, piece. And so what you guys did uh, by hand was, uh, was difficult uh, for your first time, but um, I encourage you to stick with it because once you have a, a repository of templates and you get a little bit used to it, um, it is one ASCII text file. And we deployed one environment here. Um, in production, we deployed very complex environments with load balancers and L3 routing and um, you know many tiers, networks auto-created, things like that. And developers now, instead of saying, "Give me a VM," you know this, they they you know they got a little bit of the the drug. Now they can have like a VM in two minutes. You know that's all managed. Now they want you know a whole environment. You know, give me, give me, you know, two web servers, two app servers, two database servers, and give it to me in six minutes instead of two minutes. Um, but you speed that up for them, and if operations, um, you know, can streamline to that level, that's what it's, that, that's what it's there for. So. Um, give me a second for my, my Windows VM on my Mac. Um, to come up actually. Okay, we got like 12 minutes. Let's see. All right. I really didn't do anything, did it? Clear up there, good. All right. Oh, out. <laughs> so I'm clearly a, a Mac a noob. Um, no? I, I, did, I think it's mirrored. Hold on a second. There we go. I know it's like a, a game. <laughs> Hold on a second. No, just stay there, please. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to mirror the displays, apparently. There we go. Um, I thought I had a mirror from this arrangement. Mirror displays, here we go. Hey. So, there it is. All right. There we go. You guys get to read all my email. Uh, it. Eat, okay. So, a little bit of a different tack, um, and I'm just gonna go through a, a couple things here. Um, <clears throat> the, so there's, uh, dev, who's, who's messed around with DevStack? Okay, all right, good. So, um, DevStack, for those of you guys who don't know, it is what, um, essentially, I, would, I could probably stand up here with confidence and say 100% of people developing against uh, OpenStack are probably using DevStack. It's a single git uh, call to a repo and a single command to give you a, an OpenStack environment running on bare metal, an all-in-one OpenStack environment. Um, obviously not for production, but you, you can do functional testing and write all your code. All the Rackspace developers who write code for the public cloud, it has to pass uh, the DevStack uh, muster before it can go on and, and be considered you know, for any, any rack space adoption. So it's, we, we write on it. So the, there's a, there's a, I'm gonna give you the link and these are, these are posted, but have, taking DevStack and for this advanced tutorial, um, telling it to give me Salometer and load balancers of service and L3 and um, some of these advanced things that I needed to, to do this was a little bit of a, a, a trick to get that going. So I'm not gonna go through line by line. Um, but at the end, you know, stack.sh, <clears throat> there's one shell script, um, and you know, like six minutes later, uh, you've got a fully functioning environment. Um, there's a, you don't have to give it a local.conf uh, file, an, an answer file or a, a init file, um, but if you wanna do some of the, if you don't wanna take just the defaults, um, then, you, then you do have to uh, put some of this stuff in, so. Um,
Uh, what you guys didn't uh, do today was go to the command line to um, do some of these, these uh, commands by hand. What you'll, what you'll find when you, when you do that is you're going to have to uh, export the variables that tell your session at the CLI. And, very, and similarly, you do the same with JSON. Um, to, to say this is my tenant name and this is my authorization URL. <clears throat> It's just basically sending those variables so that when you execute a command like Nova list or uh, Keystone tenant create or something like that, um, it knows to you know where to log in and look that stuff up. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I thought it was interesting to look at how uh, the environments were created that I that I built. So I took two servers, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, um, with like 90 gigs of RAM. And, and a 300 gig SSD. And what I was going to do in this ex exercise was each table was a team, and it was going to be uh, kind of like a hackathon um, bake off competition, right? And I had some scenarios for you guys to go through, but um, each table was a city on the East Coast or the West Coast. And what might be interesting, so with one, and this is Bash, it's not Heat, so this is the, this is the, uh, the stepchild, or you know, this this was before the the sexiness of heat. But you can take a bash script, and I created 20 instances, and I set all of my quotas, um, and I and and I actually created uh, users, you know, for, for the um, to get log in and get that all that stuff. So, it's you know maybe 12 lines, and I created my 20 tenants, uh, created the quotas for all those tenants, um, and also created the. Uh, the, the local user accounts as well. <clears throat> so, I mean, we, we're out of time on the, on the exercise, but it's kind of too bad uh, because <clears throat> you could have been you could have been a heat initiate or a heat pad of one or a heat master, and you'd get fifty points, but. A, or, you know, 200 points, or you could like make something up, right? Um, what was, you know, earlier back here, you'll see I do a git. So line six, um, there was, there's probably 100 heat templates out there, right? Um, I mean, if you guys have been around the industry, you know the power of open source. I mean, there is a, uh, there is a selfish and non-selfish reason. Like if I put my template out there and someone uses it, debugs it, makes it better, like I'm, I'm have a good, you know, have a good reason to want to share that. So, um, just like the people who developed Heat, you know, why not throw the Heat templates um, out there? So you can pretty much find uh, something that's close to what you need to do. Um, the manual, like learning curve, that that's as bad as it gets. Um, and it gets, you know, it gets better after that. You, just, you, you build some, a template library, uh, and you get more creative with it, and, you know, go on down the road. So, we're probably over time. Um, other, we got five minutes. How about, is there any more Q&A? Yeah. Right, so that, that, that's a good question. He's talking about um, inserting the IDs as the template is being created. It's like, well, correct me if I'm wrong, you're talking about if, if the template needs a network, creates the network, and then grabs the UID from that network. Um, so that's like the third time I've had that question. Um, yes, it's abs the, is the short answer. Yes, it's absolutely po uh, possible. It is a bit of a chicken and egg thing, and you do have to work around it, but it is a very popular use case. Um, that that we do. So um, I've got I well, I'll have these posted, and I think they're I'll leave the I'll leave the last slide up with my site that has the templates on there.